All right. Welcome back to MMA Al Dente. I'm here to talk to you guys about UFC Fight Night, whatever the fuck, Vera vs. Cruz. So I think there's 14 fights on the card. I'm going to give you my predictions, bets along the way. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. It's really important that this channel grows to have 11 or 12 subscribers or whatever. All right. Uh, let's see. I'm going to start at the top. Uh, Marlon Chito Vera versus Dominic Cruz. My prediction for the fight is Marlon Vera puts Cruz away. Now, Cruz hasn't been legitimately stopped. I still think he was alive in that Cejudo fight. He hasn't been legitimately stopped since Uriah Faber put him away with a guillotine choke 35 years ago. So, this is a tall task for Marlon Vera, but I just, that's the way I see it, things trending. And La Cruz showed incredible recoverability, if that's a word, and tenacity and all the other adjectives in his fight against um, Pedro Munoz, who dropped him cleanly. Like, it looked like he knocked him out on his feet for a split second, but that's all it was, was a split second. Cruz was back in that fight, and he was in... Um, Pedro's face, and he wore him down and stole that fight, a tight three-round decision, and the guy that got dropped twice early on ended up winning it, so the hustle is still there from Cruz, like, you know, I, I did say my prediction is Marlon Vera via whatever, KO, round three, I don't know, but uh, I do think Dominic Cruz via decision is absolutely a possibility, and the second greatest possibility, I do think if they go to a decision, Dominic Cruz should win it because he's going to be out hustling Marlon Vera. Marlon Vera is a guy who, in plenty of his fights, he's been losing until he wins. That's almost his trademark. Even in the Rob Font fight, that was the, that was the anomaly because he won a five-round decision with opportunistic moments. Knockdown submission, knockdown whatever. He, you know, really beat up Rob Font in that fight, but uh, still, you know, and I don't remember if he scored any 10-8s or whatever, but I remember it being like at the end of every round, Marlon Vera would hurt Rob Font, and he would steal the round, and that's how he stole the fight. It reminded me of, uh, I think I said this after the fight, Piotr Jan taking out Jimmy Rivera in a three-round decision. He won the third round, but the first two were going Jimmy Rivera's way, clearly, up until the last few seconds of the round, of each round. And that's where Jan stole the round and the fight. But, look, that's a trait of Marlon Vera. Like I said, it's his M.O. He's a, an opportunistic fighter, one of those guys, like, that just, uh, he finds a moment and he hurts you. Usually when he hurts you, he puts you away. But he doesn't have to be winning the fight, ever, for me to, you know, consider him, uh, the favorite, even, you know, within a fight. And Dominic Cruz, look, he's as tough as they come. I wouldn't put it past him at all to win a decision. That's why I bet on him to win any sort of a decision at plus 225, which is uh, not m much greater at all than plus 200, which is his money line. So normally in a situation like that, I'd be like, that's fucking stupid. Just play the money line. And actually, I think I kind of just talked myself into it. No, but I have I already have Cruz at, at decision at plus two twenty five. But the money line there may be more worth uh, you know more to it because Dominic Cruz could cut Chito Vera. That's really his only other path to victory. I don't see anybody knocking out or choking out Chito Vera anytime soon. He's got plenty of losses against some of the deadliest fighters, and no one's put him away. And I do think Dominic Cruz, you know, his victory is reliant upon wrestling. He's going to have to out-wrestle Marlon Vera. He could outpoint him on the feet, too, of course, and I'm sure he will score points there. But uh, he doesn't want to be on the feet. Just the guy, you know, Marlon's too deadly. He's a weird fighter. He's very laxed, if that's the word. He's relaxed. He's uh, deceptively dangerous. Even though everybody's seen his highlights, they all know how dangerous he is. But I feel like he lures people in within the fight to the point where they're too comfortable and uh, they don't realize within that fight how deadly he is. I'm going back to his fight with Brad Pickett. That was his retirement fight. And he was just seconds, maybe minutes, away from winning that fight. He had already banked two rounds. And Cheeto caught him with a head kick. 
And that's that. at that time, I dismissed it as a fluke. But then watching him win all these close fights by just taking over and having that moment, Andre Ewell and whoever the fuck, everybody else, he... Uh, He's, you know, he's got me convinced. It's just, it's his trait where he's always deadly. I do, do see him being outpointed up until he gets the finish that I'm imagining. But I see Vera getting a finish. And Dominic Cruz, look, he's only getting older. He still, like, you know, looks great in there. He looks like a top fighter, even in some of his, you know, closer victories against uh, what would have, would have been thought to have been shittier competition like Casey Kenny, even Pedro Munoz. Cruz still showed at the very least he's got the tenacity, he's got the heart, and he will battle to win those rounds. And uh, he did. And I do expect that battle to be within him. I don't think, you know, he's somebody that's going to quit and get TKO'd or whatever. You're going to have to knock him out or close to it where there's at least a bad stoppage like uh, the Henry Cejudo fight. As long as, uh, what's his name? The guy that smells like cigarettes and booze, Gary, whatever the fuck. I don't know, I'm losing it. But Cruz, you know, he didn't like the refereeing in that fight. Damn it, what the hell is his name? Gary something. I, I know these refs, I know all of them, but I draw a blank when I have to uh, draw one of their names. But anyway... Uh, Cruz was upset about that, and I'm sure whoever this ref is is aware of that situation, and Cruz will be given all the life he needs, all the chances he needs. I just think Marlon Chito Vera is too deadly, and if he has Cruz hurt where Pedro Munoz had him hurt, at any point in the fight, he's going to put him away. And unlike Pedro Munoz, Marlon Vera is only more likely to find those opportunities. Pedro Munoz, you know, if he's going to put you away, it's early. It's round one. But Chito Vera, especially with five rounds with which to work, to sound like John Anik, five rounds to work with, he's able to get it done, I think, against most fighters. And a guy that's only getting more vulnerable and potentially more fragile, I'm um, just, I'm betting on Vera. I really, uh, I think it's possible. I like the KO rounds two, three, and four, plus 600 KO, TKO, whatever, uh, rounds three, four, five, plus 850. So, you know, heavy bets, I guess, on rounds three and four there. But those are, you know, I just, I don't see it happening early. And look, Dominic Cruz, he's a, he's a really good striker as well. I talked about how he needs to win the fight wrestling and whatever. I see him winning the fight on the feet up until he loses. I see Cruz outpointing Vera. He moves so well, and, uh, you know, no one still can put a finger on his movement, what you call that. But it's very unique. And his striking is there for him. You know, I don't doubt for one second he could piece Marlon Vera up on the feet. Those wild hooks coming in and out from all these different angles. But he's going to need a takedown to make his striking game more effective. He's going to need a takedown to win striking or wrestling-wise. Obviously wrestling-wise. But you're going to need that takedown. So Cruz has to hit that takedown early just to be able to mix things up and maybe make the next takedowns come more easily. You know, he's uh, he's really going to have to work in this fight, and he's going to have to be perfect. You know, perfect, because uh, like I said, Marlon Chito Vera, above anybody in the division, anybody, Piotr Jan, Aljo, whoever, Marlon Vera is the, the guy you need to be perfect against, because Vera will make you pay. And he'll, he'll do it with 30 seconds left in any round, round five, round one, whatever. But uh, yeah, so that's how I see the fight going. My predictions, my prediction is Vera via TKO round three. My second prediction is Cruz via decision, which you can get at plus 225. You know, like I said, I've already bet on that, but I do think the money line is the smarter bet if there's only 225 separating, uh, only 25 separating the money line versus the decision prop, because uh, even Chito Vera can get cut, but he's not getting finished, not legitimately. All right, next up, the co-main event. Nate Lamwer versus David Onama. I really like uh, I, I like both of them in this fight, I, but uh, I think they're both going to have a great showing, but I think Onama is going to win. I do think, you know, uh, Nate Lamwer is a guy that can find, he's kind of like Chito Vera in a way, but he's the guy that's going to take over the fight. I see Nate Lamwer, uh, you know, being a really tough out for a, any fighter that can't put him away. 
because he's going to be in your face. He's relentless, and he's a really strong finisher. In the overall sense of the fight, he's a really strong finisher in that he always has a third round, and finishing-wise, he'll TKO you, he'll submit you, like we saw against Ludovic Klein. I believe that might have even been his only submission, or one of his only submissions, but Nate Lamware is a guy that's a... Uh, He's a versatile fighter, and in particular, he's a deadly fighter when you're getting tired. David Onama, I don't see, it's not like I've seen these problems from him. I've seen some wrestling defense that I thought maybe could have been sharper. I've seen some, uh, you know, uh, I don't know what you, if you'd call it like a mental issue or whatever, but I thought in that Mason Jones fight, he was clearly behind and he wasn't able to, you know, create any opportunities for himself. He needed to make something happen there. And that could be an issue with his overall tenacity and whatever. Maybe he was afraid of getting finished, but it didn't seem like he was afraid of losing in that fight. So I wanted to see more tenacity from him. But durability, I can't say I've seen any weakness in him, durability-wise, submission-wise or, you know, chin-wise. And while I do believe Nate Lamware can win this fight in round three, just because Onama's so young and inexperienced, I do like David Onama in this fight. I'm not sure if he's going to be able to put Nate, Nate Lamware away. I do think if he does, it'll be a knockout round one, which is something I've bet on. But I also think David Onama, I think his most likely path to victory, and my prediction, is a decision in this fight. I do think he's got, uh, he's got a lot of size and strength, and I do think he's got the grappling as well to... Uh, uh, shut down Nate Lamware. Nate Lamware is a guy who's been knocked out twice in the UFC by wild knees, Julian Arosa and uh, Herbert Burns. And I'm a Darren Elkins guy. I thought Darren Elkins beat him in that fight. You know, I thought Elkins won rounds one and three, I think. But Nate Lamware was in that fight, absolutely. And it wasn't a robbery at all. You know, so you want to give him that victory, you, you could only praise him for, uh, you know, outlasting Elkins. And, you know, Nate Lamware showed in that fight, which I think was short notice, that he's, you know, he's a really tough out for anybody. That was a tough, tough debut there. Or that wasn't his debut. That was his second fight. But Darren Elkins is a guy that's going to break you, especially if you're some young, young, inexperienced fighter. And Nate Lamware is a guy that, you know, I think he proved on the uh, European circuit, fighting some really good competition. He's a guy that's going to break you late in that fight, too. So, I like Lamb where to win via round three. I'm going to play that, plus 1,200. But my prediction is just he's physically outmatched here, and David Onama shuts him down. I do think Onama could win via knockout round one, plus 425. I've bet on that. But I'm betting on Nate Lamware's toughness. I think if he survives round one, he's uh, this fight goes to a decision. Unless, of course, Landwehr gets a finish in round three which I did bet on, but Onama via decision plus 240, I'm not um, in love with that, but it's good enough, absolutely, and uh, that's my prediction. Next up, Yasmin uh, Haregui versus Yasmin Lucindo, all right, I uh, don't know Lucindo too well, I've tried to look up her uh, footage and fights, I'm, not, I'm really going to stay away from this betting-wise, but I trust Yasmin more as a fighter. Stylistically, I would be more inclined to take Lucindo, to be honest. She's more of a grappler, and yeah, Yasmin uh, Harigui is a fucking mean boxer. She's really exciting. She's one of those girls that I think will uh, actually put some people away inside the octagon. So, I, gun to my head, I'm going with Harigui. You know, she's not the grappler here. The Lucindo's more the grappler, and I think she's a little bigger and thicker. But Yaregui, I have been able to watch her fight, and she's going to be a tough girl to wrangle. Really tough girl to out-wrestle, and absolutely a tough girl to outwork. You know, you can, um, I think Lucindo's course to victory here is to smother her on the ground. Not try to finish her, and uh, not really to try to work too much. You're better off sitting in that guard than trying to pass it. And uh, giving her an out. Because on the feet, Haragui is going to be putting up points. If not putting away Lucindo. So I expect a close fight. I'm hoping Lucindo has her moments here. 
But uh, I am expecting Haragui just because I trust her more and I know her more. So I'm going with Haragui via uh, decision. You can bet on it at plus 175, but uh, I'm not going to bet on it. Lucindo's got some losses or earlier in her career, but still, and I say earlier in her career, she's 20 years old right now, and these losses were four or five years ago. So you can dismiss those losses, I suppose, just because she was a, you know, a smack dab in the middle of her teens. But at the same time, she's still young now. And I don't see her being, you know, the most seasoned, polished fighter, even with an exp you know, a good amount of experience at age 20. I trust Haragui, and I'm taking her. But uh, I'm staying away from the bets because I just don't know that much about these fighters. Next up, Devin Clark versus uh, Azmat Mer Merzakhanov. This fight could go one of two ways, or maybe one of three ways. Merzakhanov knockout early. Devin Clark taking over the fight, winning a decision, or Merzakhanov via knockout late, like we saw last time against uh, Tafan and Chukwi. But I'm taking Merzakhanov to get the finish here early. I think, um, I do think, I always thought, no matter what, even if Clark wins, Merzakhanov's going to have his moment early. And Devin Clark, look, I trust him. I trust him if he doesn't get finished to make a fight with just about anybody. But I don't trust him not to get finished. And this is a guy who's just, on paper at least, too deadly. Merzikhanov is. And Devin Clark, we've seen him finished. You know, both knockout submission. I think the latest was against uh, Anthony Smith last year. Or two years ago. I don't know. But either way, he's never looked good when he's finished. And Merzakhanov, I do think he's got the uh, striking, still the striking prowess to just be too much for Clark. Clark, I see him, uh, you know, with those big, strong legs wobbling. I see him wobbling on those legs early in round one. I'm taking Merzakhanov via KO round one, which you can bet on at plus 400. I, uh, again, I wouldn't be surprised at all if Devin Clark won this fight via decision. He's a guy we've seen him outgrind some, you know, uh, big, nasty, light heavyweights, especially lately, but uh, not that William Knight is big. I think I'm bigger than him, but uh, either way, uh, I'm betting against him here. Mirza Konov, I didn't like the way he looked against Nchukwi at all, you know, uh, not in the middle of that fight, but he ended up getting the finish late, which was impressive. Really impressive, because usually a guy that's in the octagon, all this new shit, new experiences, I expected him to fall apart, and he didn't. And uh, that was impressive, but still, uh, I like his money line at minus 145, Merzakhanov, because it covers all paths to victory. But I think his most likely path to victory is getting a knockout round one. So that's my prediction and my bet. I bet on uh, the money line as well, but uh, still. All right. Next up, Priscilla Cachoeira versus Ariane Lipsky. I think that's next up. I already covered this last week. I'll give you my thoughts on it again. Although there are some new wrinkles to this fight now. These girls are fighting at 135, which uh, you know, I don't see that really affecting the fight too much. I do think it could give Lipsky more of an advantage if she's sitting on top of Cachoeira, but I'm not married to that notion my prediction remains the same however Lipsky's getting a finish via submission and I'm predicting that it goes under two and a half rounds that's my bet which you can get at plus 140 Cachoeira she's Vandalay Silva okay she's still Vandalay Silva as a woman so she's not able to put too many people away or whatever but if anybody can it's Priscilla Cachoeira now, Ariane Lipsky's been put away twice by strikes, but they were from ground and pound. It was the jujitsu that failed her there. And I don't see that being a path to victory for Cachoeira, you know, ground and pound. I think she's going to have to beat the shit out of Lipsky. I mean, could be ground and pound, but it's not going to be a methodical guard passing. She's going to have to beat the shit out of her swarmer and get a TKO. Lipsky, on the other hand, she's going to have to really control Cachoeira on the ground. She's going to have to take her to the ground and be able to control her. And Lipsky, I think, just has a plethora of submissions. We saw that knee bar over uh, Luana Carolina. I think it was Luana Carolina. I just see Cachoeira falling in one way or another. I'd like to see the, uh, the uh, conventional rear naked choke, which I'm sure Lipsky has that in her arsenal, especially in this fight here, because we saw Cachoeira lose to... Uh, 
Valentina Shevchenko. Was that a rear naked choke or did she just beat the shit out of her? I remember the fight vividly, just not the finish. I remember it being a bloodbath. It's like a horror movie. And uh, same with Jillian Robertson anyway. Uh, Jillian Robertson took her out via submission. That's more what I see this fight uh, being like. I don't see Lipsky having the top game prowess that Jillian Robertson has, but she's more versatile submission-wise. And I do think she's going to find a way to take Cashewara out of this fight. The hedge on that, of course, with the under, is that Cashewara Vandalay Silva's her, which, uh, you know, like I said, I think Cashewara, generally speaking, her path to victory is a decision, but uh, against Lipsky, who knows? Lipsky's been finished. Uh, again, it's not like she was taken out on the feet or whatever, but uh, still, I, I, it gives me a little bit more of a whatever. Uh, insurance when I'm betting on the under, which is under two and a half rounds plus 140. My submission Lipsky via submission round two. Next up, Bruno Silva versus Gerald Mearshart. I really hope Mearshart wins. I really hope he's able to take Bruno Silva down and submit him in round two, round three. But that's not my prediction. I'm going with Bruno Silva via knockout. Bruno Silva hits like a fucking truck. And Gerald Mearshart is tougher than people think he is. Most people, because all they know is the Hamza Chemaev loss. But that still happened. And so did his loss against, uh, fuck, Ian Heinish. And look, Bruno Silva is just, he hits harder than anybody. Than anybody. And he's absolutely got a great chance of knocking out Gerald Mearshart in any round. You know, Mearshart's always got the chance of a submission in any round. You can't put him away. You're going to be in trouble, blah, blah, blah. Same goes for Bruno Silva with the knockout. My prediction is Bruno Silva via knockout. I haven't seen the flat odds yet, but uh, round one, it's like plus 160 or something. I'll do that when I'm drunk enough, but I just don't see it right now. I just don't uh, feel it. But, uh, yeah, I do think Bruno Silva is going to put away Gerald Mearshart. I don't see Mearshart being able to wrangle Bruno Silva. And I don't see him being able to fatigue Bruno Silva in any other way than wrangling him and smothering him. So, I'm going with Bruno Silva via knockout. Could come in any round. Next up. Oh, and I don't like the under for that fight because it's set at one and a half rounds and whatever. But, uh, or no, it's, yeah, I think it's one and a half rounds. But I do, uh, I do want to wait for the prop bets to come out so I could see how to bet on Bruno Silva via knockout. And of course, I'll hedge with Mearshart via submission, round two or three. Prelim main event, Angela Hill versus Lupe Godinez. I've got, uh, I've got this fight being a lot closer than most people, I think. I'm betting on Hill to win via decision, plus 425. I'll take that any day of the week, any day of the week. Lupi Godin, as I see what everybody else sees, she's, I mean, she looked amazing in that last fight. That was one of the cleanest performances ever. It's a shame she didn't get a finish over Ariane Canalosi. But uh, Angela Hill, despite having weaker wrestling, at least on paper and whatever, she's a tough woman to beat with just wrestling. She's really tough to beat. You know, and she's got plenty of losses, and if you've seen them, you know, plenty of those are controversial, especially those tough losses as of late. But uh, Lupi Godinez, I don't know if she's got that technique like uh, Tisha Torres has to give her problems on the feet and make the takedowns come more easily. And Angela Hill, look, it's not like she's the best striker, but we've seen her on the feet with everybody. Amanda Lemos and Jessica Andrade, and she's given everybody hell. I do think Angela Hill uh, is, you know, well, she's the opposite of Ariana Canalosi in that, look, they're both strong girls, but it's different types of strong. Canalosi's a brick shit house. Angela Hill is long and lanky and whatever. And, uh, you know, she's going to need to use leverage to defend takedowns. I just see it being a path to victory for Angela Hill, stuffing enough takedowns of Lupi Godinez, who I do think will get her down. But uh, Angela Hill's a versatile fighter. And, uh, you know, I see what everybody else sees. Believe me, I could see uh, Lupi Godinez controlling her on the ground. And just all she has to do is do that twice and she wins this fight. But Angela Hill's a fighter. She always tends to make things close. And on the feet, I think she 
has a distinct advantage, especially on the feet in the last two rounds of this fight. Now, she's got to be able to circle out and circle away because Lupi Godinez will be all over her. But uh, I see Angela Hill being much better in the clinch, even though she's much weaker than Canelosi. And I see Angela Hill making this a real fight. My prediction, if I had to go one way, suppose I'd go with uh, Angela Hill to win a decision. But even if I said Lupi Godinez, my only bet for this fight is Angela Hill to win a decision. There's no money there on Lupi, and there's absolutely value on Angela Hill. I'm telling you this fight is closer than people think it is. Lupi Godinez wasn't able to dominate uh, Jessica Penne, who's Hill's training partner, and uh, whoever else. Juana Carolina, who's, you know, twice the size of any other woman uh, that in this weight class, but... Still, I think Angela Hill's got enough skill and physical traits to make this a much closer fight than uh, her odds suggest. Much closer. So, Angela Hill, plus 425. That's my decision. And my pick, I'll take split decision via draw. No, I don't know. But I'll take Hill via decision. Fuck it. Now watch Loopy get on top of her and just fucking dominate her. I would love to see Loopy Godinez finish this fight. You know, or dominate like she did against Canelosi. But uh, still, and look, if she won a scrappy fight against Angela Hill where it was a split decision, but Loopy's wrestling was there for her throughout, throughout 15 minutes, that would probably be the most impressive statement, to be honest. But regardless, I'm thinking of this as a better, I have it in my head, it's going to be a close fight. And I've convinced myself that Angela Hill is going to win. All right, next up, Martin Boudet versus... Uh, Lucas Breschi. Breschi. I don't know. I like Boudet in this fight. Boudet is a finisher. He's considerably bigger than Breschi. Breschi, I just haven't seen him challenge too much. You know, not on paper. And while he's looked good against shit competition, this guy Boudet is bigger, stronger, better, and better. And, uh, I don't know if he can be better and better, but either way. I see Boudet roughing up uh, Fatigue Breschke in the middle of this fight, maybe even the end of round one, but definitely by the time round two rolls around, that size is going to start to play a factor. And uh, Boudet, he hasn't been finished. I think he had that one loss early to Juan Espino, of all people, uh, who's, you know, I think he's still in the UFC, but he's probably never going to fight again. But that guy is one of the guys who had the talent to be incredible in this fight. He just got in, in this game. He just got into the fight game too late. But anyway, Boudet, I see him being the bigger, stronger, meaner guy in the middle of this fight, and he's going to rough Breschke up. I see him getting a finish middle of this fight, second round probably. Next up, Cynthia Calvillo versus Nina Nunes. Look, Nina Nunes is going to win round three if it's there. If it gets there, which I do think it'll get there. But Cynthia Calvillo, I'm sure she's going to win round one, and I don't know how round two is going to go. I'm inclined to pick, if I had to put a gun to my head, Cynthia Calvillo wins a decision. Why? Because I think she is a very good backpack. She's really good at sucking, you know, at taking your back, and that's the end of the round. She hasn't been able to put away many fighters, not as of late in the UFC. Earlier on in her career, she was able to get it done. And Nina Nunes, I think, is above and beyond that uh, that level of fighter that gets tapped by Cynthia Calvillo here, gets smoked by her. She's not Mackenzie Dern. But Ma Cynthia Calvillo has a lot of the same traits as Mackenzie Dern. And I could see her absolutely winning at least one round, if not two, with a body triangle, with a back take. And I know she's got takedown prowess, especially early in the fight. I just, I am worried about Cynthia Calvillo as a fighter. After watching her call it off against Andrea Lee last year, that was disheartening. And, you know, especially seeing her cry and whatever, she was really upset in the cage. That was a tough loss for her. But she's still showing a lot of skill where she's fighting one of the best fighters in the world, Nina Nunes. And I've got Cynthia Calvillo favored here. Now, I will say I've bet on a draw for this fight. Every card, I look at the whole card and say, which one's going to go to a draw? 
And Nina Nunes versus Cynthia Calvillo is the one I picked to be a draw. Because I expect Nina to be there in round three, where Cynthia Calvillo generally slows down, especially if she's getting beaten up. And I also expect Cynthia Calvillo to win round one. Once she wins rounds, it's with taking someone's back. So I think the potential for a 10-8 is there in this fight. And I know at least between rounds one and three, I expect them to be split. So... If any fight was worth a draw, it'd be this one, and I bet on it at plus 6,600. Here I am actually advising you to bet on a draw, in case you didn't know how fucking stupid I am. But uh, Nina Nunes could win this fight too. There's value on her to win a decision, which I think is plus 275. I don't know. It's something like that. There's absolutely value on her to win a decision, because again, I'm sure if it goes to round three, she's the fresher fighter, she's the badass. But Cynthia Calvillo, uh, you know, I, I think she's tougher, especially than she looked last time out. And Nina Nunes is a lot of things. One thing she's not is Jessica Andrade, who put Calvillo away. And I see Calvillo being able to find more success grappling-wise than she did against Jessica Andrade anyway. Which, she had some success smothering her, but uh, if she smothers Nina, she's going to get her down at least once. So my prediction for the fight, I'll go with Cynthia Calvillo via decision. Maybe a majority decision or something. No, but uh, Cynthia Calvillo via decision. I do think her grappling is enough to uh, uh, score her two rounds against uh, Nina Nunes. And Nina Nunes is not deadly enough to put her away. And Nina is also tough enough not to get finished. So, And good enough grappling-wise not to get finished. So those are my thoughts on that fight. Either buddy, either fighter could win a decision or could go to a draw. I expect rounds one and three to be split, and I'm predicting Cynthia Calvillo wins a decision. She wins round two. Next up, Gabriel Benitez versus Charlie Ontiveros. <sighs> my prediction for this fight is Gabriel Benitez via knockout, and that's like the only thing I didn't bet on. I've bet on Charlie Ontiveros via knockout round one, plus 1,000. And I sprinkled something on round two, plus 1,600. Because he's got six inches and three weight classes on Gabriel Benitez. Gabriel Benitez is a guy we've seen wobbled at 145. And he's fighting a big monster in Charlie Ontiveros. I don't want to say monster. Make him have to sound like whatever. Fucking Nganu. He's been finished fucking 12 times. Out of eight losses, I think. I That was a joke, but it's something like that. He's knocked out every fucking time he loses, Charlie Ontiveros. And I know Gabriel Benitez, at least just on, you know, basic UFC level. He's the UFC level guy. He's good enough to knock out Charlie Ontiveros. He's absolutely good enough. He's going to have to slow him down with some of those mean kicks, I'm sure, and whatever. But he's good enough to get it done. Question is, is he good enough to handle Charlie Ontiveros kicking his ass for a few minutes, because that's what I expect. Ontiveros comes out like a bat out of hell. He's uh, flashy, got some wild strikes, and he's got size, and absolutely, he's got reach here. Gabriel Benitez has a submission game. He's got a grappling game. He can make that work for him, but even that could be tough against such a bigger guy. I just, I know Gabriel Benitez wins this fight, you know, or he's the favorite to win the fight at any point in their lives, but after seeing him get knocked out by uh, Onama and Charlie Ontiveros, despite him being knocked out in every one of his fights, even his victories, they're all knockout losses. I think there's value here on Charlie Ontiveros via knockout round one. My prediction, he almost gets it, falls apart, and Benitez gets on top of him and pounds the shit out of him round two. That's the end of the fight. The under is not worth it. The Benitez odds really aren't worth it, although the submission odds are, which, you know, I, I don't see much value in that. Ontiveros has been finished so many times, never once via submission. I think by the time it gets there, he would have been knocked out by Benitez, you know, with a ground and pound or whatever. So, uh, but there are, there's some value on the submission odds just because they're fucking crazy. For him to get a submission in round one, two, and three is plus 2,000, 2,400, uh, 3,000. It's insane. But uh, my prediction is Gabriel Benitez gets a finish round two TKO. And my real bet, my only real bet for the fight is Charlie Ontiveros via knockout round one. Trust me when I tell you, there's a possibility there. It reminds me of when Jai Herbert fought uh, Ilya Teporia. 
I remember saying, oh my God, there's such great money on uh, uh, Jai Herbert getting a knockout. And there were, this, it was a similar fight. But uh, Benitez is no Taporia, and Antaveros is no uh, whoever the fuck. Uh, Jai Herbert. You know, uh, Jai Herbert, his chin looked good in his last outing, but uh, Charlie Antaveros, every time he loses, it's a knockout. And again, every time he wins, he's knocked out somehow. Okay. Next up, O'Day Osborne versus Tyson Nam. I really wanted to see prop odds for this fight. There were no prop odds. And I wanted to make this video. I don't want to wait till Friday to make the video or whatever. So I, uh, I thought I would absolutely be betting on Tyson Nam because I think there's some value there. But really my prediction and what I'm looking to bet on is O'Day Osborne via knockout. I think O'Day Osborne... You know, he's a versatile fighter, more versatile than Tyson Nam, but I don't see this submission being a path to victory here. This will be a fight that's largely held on the feet. And O'Day Osborne is 30 years old. Tyson Nam's about to be 39 in like a month. He's going to be 39 in a month and a half. He's been knocked out before plenty of times, but it's been years. His chin's held up lately. I just see, especially with a long layoff, he's had a year and a half layoff, I think. O'Day... Coming into his own, he, you know, had some enough rough losses. A debut against Brian Kelleher is really tough. And then going up against uh, Manel Kopp, who's fucking surging, and he got knocked out there. That could happen here, which is why the only bet I've played is the under at minus 125. I don't see money on, I don't see value on O'Day Osborne's money line. So under two and a half rounds, minus 125 is my bet. But I'm looking to bet on O'Day Osborne knocking Tyson Nam out. I know Tyson Nam will always be looking for the knockout, which means the fight will be held on the feet. He's about to be 39, hasn't fought in a year and a half, and he's fighting a bigger, stronger athlete. A better, stronger athlete, I should say. I don't know their exact size, but O'Day's the better athlete. I'm taking O'Day to get it done via knockout. And I know Zaruk Adashev, who, Adashev, who both of them knocked out, actually. His chin shouldn't be uh, really, you know, his chin is inadmissible in breaking down the fight because... It's just a weak chin for a guy, but whatever. Five MMA fights or whatever. Not the best victory for either guy. Produced a highlight for each man. But still, I do think O'Day Osborne, you know, just athletically, he's got the power there. Even if you could dismiss all of his knockouts, I could look at that guy fight and know he's a knockout artist. He's also a submission artist, but he's a knockout artist. And that's what I see happening in this fight. Tyson Nam... He'll be, you know, that's all he is as a knockout artist. He's a good enough point fighter, but whatever. He's always looking for the knockout. And in this fight, he's not going to be a point fighting, a superior athlete. He's going to be looking for the knockout, and I think he gets knocked out. I'll take O'Day Osborne to be a knockout round one. And the only bet I have is under two and a half rounds, minus 125. Which I am pleased with, almost even money, and it covers the knockout for each man. Which, you know, O'Day Osborne, like I said, he's been knocked out much more recently. And uh, Tyson Nam, the power is the last thing to go. So it's absolutely a possibility there. And I'm happy with the bet as of now. But I still want to bitch about there not being prop bets available. All right. Next up, Jason Witt versus Josh Quinlan. I went over this fight a week ago. My prediction for the fight is Josh Quinlan wins via knockout. I like Jason Witt to win via late submission in any fight against a relative newcomer. Witt's the kind of guy that can get it done. But I think Josh Quinlan is too athletic, good enough scrambler, where Jason Witt is absolutely getting knocked out. I think it happens early in the first round and a half. That's why I bet on, again, no prop bets. I only bet on the under. Under one and a half rounds, plus 130. I've got Josh Quinlan winning via knockout in round one. Jason Witt, you know, if his chin survives round one, he's going to be a problem. I just don't see it happening. You know, and, uh, you know, uh, Josh Quinlan, if he's got any sort of heart as a fighter and whatever and scrambling ability, he's supposed to win this fight. He's supposed to win this fight in by knockout. So I'm taking him to get it done. I broke down that fight better last last week, but I gotta move on here because my video's about to end in two minutes because I didn't leave enough room on the fucking camera alright, Damon uh, Blackshear making his U UFC debut good fighter, not sold on him though, completely, and he's fighting Yusuf Zalal, my prediction for this fight is Zalal wins a decision I see Zalal 
being, uh, you know, they're about the same size here. Zalal is an undersized. He's not fighting Sean Woodson, which is important here. And Zalal, I expect him to shine on the feet and to give uh, Blackshear enough trouble on the ground. Not even submission-wise, just scrambling-wise, where Blackshear can't dominate him. Blackshear is going to be, uh, you know... I, I, I've never been sold on him as a grappler. You can watch his fights with uh, Pat Sabatini, Danny Sabatello, and these are guys that are surging right now in on television in the UFC and Bellator. But uh, I just, I'm not sold on him. He doesn't look like a guy that's going to be taking the UFC by storm. I think this is his level right here, Yusuf Zalal. And uh, this is the fight he's got to win. He reminds me of, uh, fuck, who's that guy? I think he fought Zalal. Jordan, whatever. Anyway, Blackshear, you know, uh, still, he's a welcome addition to the UFC. You look at his resume, he absolutely belongs here on paper. But uh, Zalal is a kind of guy who is deceptively good. You look at his paper, and he's better than that, you know. And uh, Damon Blackshear, I don't know if he's got that that uh, bar, that grit, like, uh, or that finishing prowess, whatever, like a... Uh, Seng Wu Choi and Sean Woodson and whatever. I see Zalal being a lot more comfortable in this fight. And I see him absolutely taking over the fight down the stretch and piecing up Damon Blackshear. I don't have a bet on those fights. I will make another video recapping my bet because this video is going to end in 15 seconds. Because I didn't think I'd go that long. It's kind of production you get with this fucking MMA channel. Oh yeah, be sure to like, share, and subscribe. And... Uh, I'll talk to you guys in like two minutes when I recap this fucking video. I'm just going to let it end. I'm not even.